make you a hero War at the ground zero The devil crept into heaven God overslept on the 7th The new world order was born on September 11th all the things that are happening, like what tops the list right now? It's very difficult to pick just one thing that tops the list of things that are happening in the world now. I think an interesting thing to look at is uh, America's foreign policy that really hasn't changed under Obama, as was promised. In fact, I think being that the Republicans in the 2012 race are focusing so much on the economy, it, it's kind of... Uh, an, unspoken truth that Obama is a war president. He's not someone who came in here and shut down Guantanamo Bay like he said he was going to. I, I think one other interesting thing is the continued sort of push and pull between Republicans and Democrats uh, for show about what they're going to do about the Wall Street situation. Um, Occupy Wall Street has definitely had its impact on the process, but I think it's going to take a little bit more than just them. They're going to need to, to push through specific policy or to pressure individuals who are in power enough to make a decision. So I think between that internal struggle and the outward foreign policy issues, um, there's definitely plenty to worry about or concern yourself with if you look at the global field. I've been visiting as many occupiers as I possibly can on the road for this uh, martyr tour. And I think one of the things that's most striking to me is how even though they're trying to work more and more cohesively on uh, a strategy that's encompassing of the entire movement, it's incredibly important that they not lose sight of the fact that they do have internal problems within just that area, that they have problems that just fit that that specific county or region which they should deal with. And I think that's very important I, and I see them continuously doing that, whether it's homelessness, drug abuse, things that may not be uh, solely relegated to where they're from, but that they have to deal with on a local level and not just a federal quote unquote war on drugs, blanket on everything. You know, it's very per personable. You know, when people get help there, they're getting from someone whose first name they know. When they're talking about these horrible issues of homelessness or homeless families, these are people that have also lost their home. They're talking to people who can identify with their struggle, not some government agency that's faceless and really lives in a dimension without compassion. Any group that poses a significant uh, amount of collateral or can raise leverage against any government agency is going to try to be co-opted by just about anybody, whether it's far left or far right or what even designates that that title you know that that's up for grabs too when it comes to these because you may find factions of a group which are less inclined to be um, in line with the complete strategy but say okay I've been working with this guys whether it's a left-wing group or a right-wing group for 10 20 years I haven't seen the results I want here's the raw power and energy of a very very active and aggressive group of people that are aggressively and actively demonstrating and yet they have not like the police unfortunately have descended into violence and blind anarchy I think when they see the power of that movement the nonviolent protest but also the, the the ability to confront government that's something they want to have uh, in their arsenal of weapons so why wouldn't anybody try and infiltrate it whether it will be infiltrated I think is another story you know, we're talking about a wide collective group of people, sure. and this is, if anything else, regardless of what people want to say about them, they're not stupid people at all. Some of them are very educated, and when I say educated, it just doesn't mean that they paid an overpriced uh, bill for a piece of paper with their name on it. Some of them are individuals that have built an incredible reserve of knowledge about the Fed, you know, about the history of the Fed, and when it started how to get off of it, you know, people that have ideas about how to change a system that I think, you know, bear mention. There should also be a conversation, I think, in private, you know. Not all of the conversations that Republicans, Democrats, or even people who run this show or run any business happen completely in public. Sometimes for the integrity and for the protection of the individuals that work for it, sometimes for the protection of the message so it doesn't become marginalized, sabotaged, or diluted. They do things behind closed doors, and I told the people from the very beginning that those type of actions were going to need to take place, not in 
uh, uh, the, the, the vein of government secrecy to protect government, but rather to make sure that you know innocent people don't end up being victimized. I, I think it's important for people to realize that the only thing that this movement is is really, really at its heart trying to do is make America a more honest country, is make America a less corrupt country. You know, now of course there's always going to be some nut with a sign that says, you know, aliens are coming or repent, it's the last day. But at the end of the day, we know what the core message of the Occupy people is. So regardless of who has an issue with it or, or, or who has a problem with it, you know, you can reserve your commentary and your anger until the 2012 election when it really comes down to it, which we're right about at the doorstep of. Well, I mean, I'm not an economist, so I can't tell people how to balance their budget. or I, I can't come with a bunch of promises that I'm not capable of fulfilling. <coughs> but I think what I can tell people is this, that <coughs> in every situation where you have massive amounts of government corruption, uh, you can't rely on the people who broke the system to fix it. You know, you can't rely on overpaid Congress who doesn't really see a problem other than, fa than the fact that their constituency is angry, not actually the suffering of the people. And I'm not going to speak for all of them, but for the vast majority that have done absolutely nothing. You know, and it's funny that you know some of them want to blame the president as if they have some solution to the problem themselves. I'm not saying that the president's way is the most efficient or the right way. I'm just saying that they offer no other solution. You know, even when we talk about any other topic, you know, whether it's immigration, okay, deport 12 million people. That's not feasible. That's not possible. Uh, it's physically impossible. Um, it, it would collapse the American economy. Um, it plays into the idea that, you know, you don't understand the history of this country because not all European Americans came through Ellis Island. Uh, not all of this country was gotten through a legal means. In fact, most of it was stolen land from Native American people that if you drive from Louisiana to Houston, you'll see they did absolutely nothing with. So what was the point of stealing it from a bunch of people? When I say stealing, I know that red-blooded Americans get angry. Like some of them get even have a violent response to it. How could you say we stole anything? No one in this country has ever done anything wrong. Really? Because we use nice words for things. So when you say a pilgrim or a settler, you don't think of a, a land stealer, an invader, a robber, a thief. You know? I, I deprive the woman of a virginity. No, you're a rapist. That's what you are. So I, I think when we get rid of the mythology of America, then we begin to understand a, a clearer reaction to it. In terms of the Occupy movement, I think that's something that's incredibly important, going back to the very beginning of how all this started and seeing the different reaction that people have towards the, the fiscal crisis. Some people say, oh, it's all these you know, people who are living below their means that tried to buy extra houses when they shouldn't have. Oh, okay, you mean the uneducated class of individuals that, as they're referred to by you know, people on Fox or whatever that put, place the blame solely on them, or the predatory lenders who know everything about business, who've been doing this to people for 30 or 40 years, who's more to blame? You know, the sucker who walks in thinking, damn, I'm going to be able to give my family a nicer home, and here's a guy who's explaining it to me, and it all sounds like it's going to work out, when in reality, here's this snake oil salesman telling you that everything's going to be great, and it's really not. You know, at some point, if America truly is the country it is, it has to confront people like that. And it has to make sure that it, it doesn't allow its citizenry to be taken advantage of in that way. Fighting for freedom and fighting terror, but what's reality? Read about the history of the place that we live in and stop letting corporate news... There definitely are people that are fed up with how it is, so they're looking at alternative forms of media, whether it's this or any other. And at the same time, it, you have to realize not every one source of media is, you know, the, the voice from the burning bush. You know, at some point, it, it's incredibly important for people to watch this show or to listen to any news outlet they might have heard and cross-reference that information to do some heavy research, you know, not just to believe something insightful that's said, you know, because we fall in danger of having fear-mongering be a tool not just of the right or the left, but of the independent media sources. You know, I, I think, though, that this program, others like this, and 
the ones that are appearing on, on cable television or the ones that appear, even as satire like The Daily Show, uh, what's the whole point of it? To ask questions that people aren't normally asking. What's the point of this program? To ask questions that you won't hear normally on mainstream media. Now, are people going to criticize it and say that it's conspiracy theory? Sure, because they've never understood what a conspiracy really is. You know, they don't know that people got together behind closed doors to decide how their life would actually be. The shape of their home, the, the shape of their neighborhood, the red line districts in, in many cities, which define how people are sectioned off based upon race and class. Someone else who's not you, who didn't have a democratic process of election to have these issues pushed through, push them through. If anything's, you know, a conspiracy, look at the war in Iraq. A group of individuals who decide, okay, we're in Afghanistan, we've got bin Laden cornered, what we really ought to do is redeploy, you know, tens of thousands of troops to a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, but that we're going to say has nuclear weapons. Uh, that didn't work, so now we've got to come up with chemical weapons, now we're scrambling for different ideas. You know, I, I hate to bring it back to that, but unfortunately, I, I think that people shouldn't be so afraid of you know, a, a news outlet or a competitive independent media source as they should be afraid of just believing whatever they hear or, or, or to be suckered into a quick solution to an issue because there is none. Most of these are multi-layered issues. Not everybody is going to agree with every politician about everything, you know? Like someone was interviewing me about Ron Paul I and, I, and I, I said, you know, there were some things about him that I really liked. And then they said, well, what about this and that? And I said, well, you know, I, that's a little, you know, idealistic. And then I remember there were people that were angry because I didn't agree with everything he said. Like, you know, how can a man agree with everything that, and no disrespect to him, but this is true. He's a politician, you know, he lobbies, his days in Congress, he argues bills, you know, he represents a constituency that isn't me. He represents them. How am I going to agree with him about everything that's right for the people that live in his part of America rather versus the people that live in mine? Obviously, they're different, or he would be the congressman of Harlem, who, by the way, is a corrupt individual who happens to be a Democrat. And I think that that has no bearing on it, Democrat or Republican. I mean, people have gotten used to eating at the same trough. No wonder they don't have any table manners. I mean, it's just the way it is. Applying our vision of how the world would be on other people is absurd, you know? That's what if what someone were to do that to us and tell, come in here and say, oh, you know? Like, I explain to people when they're a little confused about the black or Latino experience in America or in the hemisphere, I said, you know, imagine if someone really did invade the Middle East, you know? Not this thing that we did where we sent a proxy in to fight against other people or the Bush way where we take a few countries over, but really hardcore old school from antiquity invasion, you know, the, the, the rape of women, the decimation of children, the, the destruction of religion, the destruction of a people's culture, to convince them that the Quran is a, is a fraud, to convince them that the Prophet Muhammad never existed, that he's not a real figure in history, right? Imagine someone doing that to America, coming here, convincing everybody, you know, Jesus Christ is a myth. The Bible is a fairy tale. You know, you're all going to worship a different God, the one that I designate. You're also going to give your children to me. Everything about you that made you an American is going to disappear. Congratulations, you've just discovered the black and Latino experience for 400 years. That is the, the transfer of power. But that's not all of our history. That's not who we are as a people. That's unfortunately a small period of time within our history. Now drawing from that example, you can apply it to a much larger uh, scale to show people, listen, if we're suffering here in this particular point in America, that doesn't mean that we have to stay in that position forever. There is an amount of organizing that is, we're capable of doing. There are actions that can be taken. I really won't like them to get violent because I know how easily that can, can turn into utter chaos. But I'm telling you right now, that if anything isn't done, then maybe that is the government strategy, to push people towards absolute breaking point status and then clamp down on them violently.
which is what a lot of people feel like is going on. If you see the Occupy protest, it's a blueprint for what people are worried about who concern themselves with that. Uh, the city, the state, the, the, the police in Oakland or, or in New York, goading the protesters, you know, uh, pepper spraying women. You know, at some point, people were going to break, and yet they haven't. You know, if you're going to call them violent protesters, I think it, it falls into a contradiction when you have 20 to 25,000 people in a mob in downtown New York. Hey, if we wanted to rip the city apart, we could have right then and there. We didn't tear the city up. Why? Because we love the city. We didn't ruin America. Why? Because we love America. Obviously, a lot more than the people who claim that they do simply because they wave a flag. We want to make the country a more efficient place, a better place. We want people to invest in America. And I think one of the greatest failures of American capitalism was just in investing in systems and institutions. Those are great, but they have to also be matched with uh, uh, investing in people. You know, huge bailout for institutions and banks, none for people. You know, we give grants to universities. We need more grants for students that want to stay here. I think more than the message of materialism, uh, what you're speaking about is the braggadocio attitude of hip hop. I think the message of materialism is one aspect of that. To say that I'm better than you, I can say it in many ways. I can beat you in a fight. I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger. I have more people on the street. I got more guns. I have prettier women. This has always been kind of a back and forth, kind of teasing, uh, uh, almost a, a vaudeville, but also very taken very seriously in the streets when people put their reputation up on the line. But I, I think having more money uh, was something that came to the forefront as a part of the corporate involvement in hip hop and therefore them wanting to use that to be the ultimate trump card to say okay who's got more skills that's great I'm glad that you can rap better than me but I've got more money than you so I'm better than you you know or you know technically I can free, you can freestyle better than me but my videos on MTV and yours isn't, so I must be better than you. You know what I mean? It, it, it plays in every aspect of life. Think about it. Imagine if I'm a college professor, emeritus, Harvard. You know, I have wonderful ideas about the economy. They just so happen to help my friends that are themselves working in Goldman Sachs or somewhere else. You, you're a camera dude working for a show. But you know what? You've spent the last 20 years, excuse my language, Researching, digging through books, reading the history of America, reading the history of the economic collapses that have occurred throughout civilizations through the passage of time. And you've amassed an incredible amount of knowledge and you present that. Simply because I have more letters behind my name and I work for some fancy institution, people are gonna believe me and they'll go so far as to, ridic so far as to ridicule you. Which is what happens in hip hop. Doesn't matter how dope people are, doesn't matter if they're incredibly skilled, I got more money than you, so I win. That's, if that's not a corporate, I said so, I told you so, I, I don't know what is. So I, I link it directly to that. Why? Because a corporation that makes 14 billion dollars a year, profit, mind you, I think you all out there know the difference between gross and net. I don't mean gross, I mean net profit, $14 billion. They come back one year, instead of making 14, they make 13 million. That company's looked at as a failure. Failure, you just made $13 billion in a year. How are you a failure? Because you're not growing, because you're not expanding, because you're not buying people, because you're not taking more, because you're not more aggressive, because you're not living up to being the virus that we all thought you could be. It's hard because I know a lot of my colleagues and these are people that are involved in hip hop and may not be uh, as political as myself, but they're also thinking minds. You know, these may be people who uh, work regular jobs, but they're thinking minds and they think to my, themselves, what does my vote really count for? You know, and I say to them that they should start with a local election and look at the numbers. Those numbers are decided by hundreds, and in some cases, decided by tens, and in some cases, decided by single-digit numbers. I mean, even if you look at, at Minnesota, 
at the, the Al Franken situation. Wasn't his vote like 127? Some ridiculous number like that. You can affect change in a certain way. I think what they feel disenfranchised by is that the candidate that they elected had all these promises and none of them come through. That, in, in an essence, makes them feel more frustrated than anything else. But I don't think they should stop voting for it. I think, though, there should be severe campaign reform. And when I say severe, I mean, like, you know, we're talking limitations to who can, you know, uh, come up with billions and billions of dollars from other people, you know, the amount of debates that need to happen, the airtime that we afford individuals, the honest answers that we demand from people uh, instead of allowing them to just glance off. You know, I remember when... Even though he, he's not necessarily known as the world's most moral man, but I remember when John Edwards uh, challenged President Cheney in a debate very late. I thought he should have come out much earlier with this about him voting against uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, birthday and all these other things that kind of expose the, the weak underbelly of the right's issues with race. Not to say the left doesn't have them, because we all heard Harry Reid's comments about you know Obama being a quote-unquote well-spoken Negro. But, I mean, it definitely does expose the right's more difficult way of covering that up and saying, all right, well, why didn't you? And when he says, you know, I believe my record speaks for itself, you know, there was almost like, okay, well, we'll accept that. And at some point, we don't need to accept that. At some point, the voting audience has to say, no, I, I don't know that your record stands for itself because I don't know what you're saying anymore. You claim that there's still a presence of Al-Qaeda in Iraq? Dude, we've gone over this, you know? How many hearts do you need to have in your chest before you come up with the right answer? At some point, you know, you just need to be honest with the American public and admit that you made a mistake. That's also another issue. They don't see accountability, so they feel uninspired to get behind a candidate. When someone comes out and says, no, this was my fault, I did this, you know? Uh, uh, Katrina, Bush, no accountability. You know, I'm sorry, I, I should have done more. I thought it was all in Brownie's hands. He was doing a heck of a job. Well, he wasn't doing a heck of a job. He wasn't doing any job. And as a result, American citizens, you know, I know there are some people watching this that, you know, they would probably be less affected if they weren't American citizens. But I, I, as a person that believes in God and, and really feels the pain of innocent people, it doesn't matter if they were citizens or not, they were people who were dying because of the negligence and the corruption in the American system. When you have an Arabian horse racer put in charge of FEMA, you know, when people see that happen, when they see that cronyism, that's when they get uninspired. I would just tell them that if they don't vote, they're going to see more of the same. The martyr doesn't come from the idea of needing to die for revolution. It comes from the idea of needing to live for revolution. You know, in the martyr, the martyr's perception in, for example, pedagogy of the oppressed is that the revolutionary must become the martyr because there are parts of him that must die. The selfishness, the ego. This is a process of death. It's not like just one day he wakes up like, oh, you know, now I don't have any issues. I, I can look past race and sexual orientation and, and class and get to the core problems that people have and how they need to be addressed. That's a process. That's a process that I've taken years and years to address, you know, updating my music, updating my flow, updating my skills, you know, updating the way my message gets across to people. So I would say it's more based upon that, not the necessity to, to give your life uh, in terms of, of killing yourself or destroying yourself, but of giving your life by dedicating yourself, by working hard, and maybe not in a conventional way. You know, maybe you are a revolutionary lawyer, a revolutionary doctor, an independent journalist. You know, maybe you, you offer health care to people in the hood. Maybe you do take pro bono cases. Maybe you're a psychologist that deals with underprivileged children that are the victims of abuse. I don't know. You can't save everybody, but you can't save someone. The new world order was born on September 11th. And you can't fathom the truth, so you don't hear me. You think Illuminati's just a fucking conspiracy theory? It's like...